Welcome everyone to Westcliff University's Distinguished Innovator Speaker Series and the final speaker in our fall series, Dr. Ernesto Ciroli, a pioneer of enterprise facilitation, a unique approach to local economic development that helps communities unleash their entrepreneurial potential. He has delivered his TED Talk, Want to Help Someone? Shut Up and Listen, to over 3 million viewers. I'm Dr. Barry Sandrew, Director of Entrepreneurship at Westcliff University and your moderator. We've got a slightly different format this morning. Dr. William Lightfoot, Dean of the Westcliff University College of Business, will be interviewing his longtime friend and mentor, Dr. Ernesto Ciroli. I'm really happy you were all able to join us this morning. As promised, we'll get to William and Ernesto in just a moment. But first, I want to briefly introduce Westcliff University to those in the webinar audience who might not be familiar with the institution. Pictured here is our campus in Irvine, California. Westcliff is an accredited private institution of higher learning with close to 6,000 students enrolled both live, online, and on campus. There are four colleges, the College of Business, the College of Education, the College of Law, and the College of Technology and Engineering. We also offer a full stack coding bootcamp certificate and a cybersecurity bootcamp certificate. To learn more about Westcliff, including our awesome undergraduate athletic program, I invite you to visit our website at westcliff.edu, as well as Westcliff University on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, TikTok, X, formerly known as Twitter, YouTube, and Red. You've all joined this webinar in listen-only mode, which means you're all muted. I welcome you to use the questions plane at the bottom of your screen to participate in this live interview, and Dr. Lightfoot will pose as many questions to Ernesto as possible as they're received. So without further ado, I want to present Dr. William Lightfoot, who will introduce Dr. Ernesto Ciroli. Bill? Thank you, Dr. Sandrew. It's a tremendous pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Ciroli today. I've known of Dr. Ciroli's work for nearly a decade, having read his book, Ripples from the Zambezi, Passion, Entrepreneurship, and the Rebirth of Local Economies, as a part of my own educational journey while I was recreating a social venture in Tanzania. His approach to economic development, best captured by his compelling TED Talk titled Shut Up and Listen, captivated me and shifted my thinking about the work we were doing. Fast forward to COVID and around 2020, I began meeting with Ernesto every other week to discuss ways we could collaborate, as well as how we could help begin to digitize some of his content. He and his wife and business partner, Martha, live in Sacramento for seven months of the year and his home village in Abruzzo, Italy for the remaining five months. His concept of enterprise facilitation, as well as his business framework, the Trinity of Management, are used widely to inspire people globally to start new businesses and to transform existing organizations and economies. From the Democratic Republic of the Congo to the state of Kansas, over 65,000 new businesses have been created in over 300 communities in 27 or more countries globally. It is with a great deal of pleasure that I introduce you to, to introduce you to my mentor and friend, Dr. Ernesto Ciroli. To get started, share with us how you got started in economic development, perhaps most specifically, what led you to the Zambezi? Uh, you want to talk <laughs> about my greatest failure? <laughs> uh, they say that it's very important to fail. Well, actually, it's very important to fail, then tell the world that you have failed <laughs> the way I did it on uh, the TED Talk. has been uh, really um, extraordinary how many people have reached out uh, saying to me, oh, you admitted a failure. <laughs> Let me tell you what we <laughs> did and how we failed. And so it's been uh, truly um, extraordinary uh, interesting to find out what happens when you share uh, your failures, not only your successes. Uh, um, what happened to me was I was a very uh, young, <laughs> naive <laughs> Um, uh, Italian um, uh, political science student. I thought that I would work in uh, maybe in the government, maybe in the diplomatic corps in Africa. And I joined an organization of technical cooperation with African countries. 
And what we would do um, from a, a, an office in Rome, sight unseen, we would conceive this fantastic development program and projects to do in Africa. And uh, what we uh, did in uh, uh, Zambia was highly embarrassing because we decided to teach the people in a village uh, in uh, at the border between Zambia and Zimbabwe, um, teach these people who did not have agriculture how to use horticulture for their own, you know, uh, well-being. And so we bought some land and we built the buildings. <laughs> And we took the Italian seeds and uh, we arrived there and we employed local people to come and cultivate. And we would teach them how to grow the Italian stuff, you know, the tomatoes, the zucchini, the lettuce. And everything grew beautifully. <laughs> but when the tomatoes were uh, ready to be harvested, the hippos came out of the Zambesi River. <laughs> and what, in one night, they destroyed everything. They ate everything. And we Italians, we say, oh, my God, the hippos. Uh, and we look at the Zambian people and the workers were laughing so hard. They had tears down their faces. And we said, did you know about the hippos? And they said, that's why we have no agriculture here. <laughs> because whatever you grow, they will come and they will eat it. See, we Italians, we, we, we don't know anything about hippos. <laughs> we don't know. And instead of asking the local people what the needs were, we would constantly arrive from Europe, sight unseen, with our ideas about what the African people ought to do. And I was, you know, really so disgusted by what we kept doing. Always conceived the program in our own, in Paris, in London, in, in Washington, D.C. And then we arrive because we know better. We know better? How can we know better? And one book changed my life. At that time, uh, they had, uh, a, there was an economist called Ernest Schumacher. He had written a bestseller called uh, Small is Beautiful. And in Small is Beautiful, he said, in development, if people do not wish to be helped, leave them alone. This should be the first principle of aid. And I thought, what do you mean? We never go in response. We always initiate, you know, our actions. We never even consider that the people in Africa are actors in their own lives. We think that it's for us to bring what we have to them. And when I understood the immense arrogance of considering the African people our, you know, beneficiaries of our, you know, uh, munificence, I thought, you know, this is so wrong what we're doing. So I went to a university in, uh, uh, in Africa, in South Africa, Stellenbosch University, with the book Small is Beautiful, and I said, I want to do a PhD. I graduated from Rome University. I had a master's in political sciences. I want to do a PhD to look at the possibility of doing economic development and social development in response. Why don't we, for once, shut up, <laughs> listen to what they need, and then work the other way around? They tell us. And we then use whatever we can, our experience, uh, we've been there maybe, or maybe we have something that we can contribute to help local people do beautifully what they love to do. And of course, my, my professor said, look, Ernesto, you can't listen to them. They're poor, unemployed, uneducated. Uh, and I had started to study psychology, grow, developmental psych uh, psychology, humanistic psychology, because those psychologists, uh, uh, people like Abraham Maslow, Carl Rogers, Eric Fromm, Adler, the post-comportamentalists, the post-behaviorists, they um, were the only people I found in the world who started with a person. And I wanted to start with, with responding to people. And those uh, counselors, 
they put the person at the center and they ask the person uh, to basically uh, tell them what is that is stopping them from being happy, from growing. And so I said to my professors, you know, every single human being in the world has a dream to improve herself. Everybody has a dream to become better, to have more, to be more. And they said to me, prove it. Uh, unfortunately, apartheid was still on in South Africa. I was not allowed to work in communities. Um, and so I moved to Australia and my uh, university professor in Australia uh, said uh, to me, oh, I don't think that you can listen to the local people, quite frankly, but Ernesto, what can I do to help you to prove me wrong? And I said to the professor, let me, um, uh, let me introduce me to a community struggling. And I do not want uh, as a missionary telling people what to do. But if a community is struggling, a neighborhood is struggling, if the local leaders find that they need help, uh, can you introduce me? And he said, yes, you're doing a PhD with a university on a scholarship. You are one of us. We will absolutely invite you. And uh, I was invited in a community, 10,000 people, 700 kilometers from the capital city. And when I arrived there, <laughs> instead of telling the local people what they should be doing, I simply walked the streets until I met the very first person who had this absolutely consuming passion to look after himself, to, um, to use his talent to produce uh, something that everybody loved. This man knew how to produce smoked uh, salmon. And he had, uh, this was a fisherman uh, village uh, and uh, the, the community was in a terrible crisis. And so what, uh, uh, what I did, I helped this first entrepreneur. <laughs> I went into his garage where he had this kiln. He was producing this fantastic smoked fish. And I said to him, uh, how come you, you know, how come you are not being able to make a living with this? And he said, look, the city council closed me down because I cannot sell fish from a garage. I can smoke it for my own use. And when I tried the fish, it was fantastic. So I said to him, uh, would you like me to help you? We, because if, and if I help you, would you then spread the word around the community? And he said, absolutely. So what I did, <laughs> I made appointments with the best Michelin star, the best restaurants in the capital city. Um, I spoke to all the chefs, then he came up, uh, we took the, the smoked fish in these fantastic restaurants and everybody put an order. When we had 10 orders for, you know, hundreds of pounds of uh, fantastic smoked uh, salmon, we went to the bank and uh, we, with those orders, we were able to get the money to go into uh, a proper building. Uh, that was approved by the local council, uh, started to employ three people, uh, it was so successful, we found an investor who put a million dollars behind him. And then this first project, uh, uh, the publicity from this first project was such that everybody followed me in the streets in this little village. And I helped five fishermen to sell the tuna, their tuna to Tokyo for sushi and sashimi, instead to the local market. We went from 60 cents a kilo to $15 a kilo, $7.50 pound for the tuna instead of 30 cents for the tuna. Uh, we had articles in the paper, national paper. <laughs> we had farmers coming. And uh, in 24 months, we had 27 um, businesses. And the Western mm -hmm. government said, Ernesto, this is amazing. What have you done here is just for, uh, formidable. Can you teach other people in other community to shut up and listen and then help people to do beautifully what they love to do? And <laughs> this is uh, uh, was the beginning of my career, really, was the beginning of what I'm doing now. Great. Fascinating. And and I believe you, you call your uh, model enterprise facilitation. Um, it seems so simple, and yet it runs so contrary to the approach that most 
NGOs and communities and businesses take, especially when working in distressed communities. One of the key concepts or frameworks that I know you refer to in your work is the Trinity of Management. Can you explain yeah. why this framework yeah. is so essential to your work? Uh, uh, yes, Bill. I could never fi find anyone who could make it, who could take it to the market, and who could look after the money with equal passion. So I would find the guy with the smoked tuna. He was fantastic at producing it, but he would never get out of his garage. <laughs> so how, how would people know? He said, oh, people in the community know. Yeah, but it's a community of 10,000 people. <laughs> you should take this to the best restaurants in the state. And he said, oh, you know, I don't even, uh, uh, you know, I'm embarrassed to do that. I, I, I'm not, I don't like to do that. So what happened was I said, well, if you cannot do it, if you don't like to do it, if you will never do it, why don't you find somebody to do it for you? So with the five fishermen, with the tuna fishermen, I found somebody who was a marketer. I took him to the village and the marketer said, have you ever shown this fish to a Japanese? And they said, no, we have never ever met physically a Japanese. <laughs> and they said, how can, you how can you sell? How can you hope to sell your fish to a Japanese if you had never taken your tuna to a Japanese restaurant, S spoken to a Japanese chef? So we organized, through this marketer, we organized for a, a Japanese chef to come to the community, speak to the fishermen, and he said, yes, we would buy this tuna for sushi and sashimi in Japan. So what happened is that we had five people producing it, one person marketing, and the five people gave 120 tons of tuna to this marketer on commission to sell mm -hmm. it. And then the wife of one of the fishermen was a banker. She had been working in the bank for 13 years. She was a certified chartered accountant. And the very first year, she had to look after $5.7 million. Hmm. So product marketing finance, and what we do, uh, we speak to the entrepreneur. We listen to very carefully to what she tells, tells us, what he tells us. And then we say, what is your natural advantage? What is that you love to do and that you do better than anybody else? That's your competitive event. Do that. But find people who complement you because the company has to do three things beautifully, not you, the company. And this, of course, then when I came to America, this is the Silicon Valley model. It was always two, three, four people working together. There is no example anywhere in the world or one entrepreneur who was born with the passion to make it, take it to the market and look after the finances. That's a trinity of management. And the trinity of management is being absolutely a revelation. It's magnificent. We believe that we had to teach it in schools, in colleges, in universities. We have to tell the truth. No single entrepreneur has ever started a successful company alone. Thank you. So the Trinity of Management, marketing, product, financial management. Your impact transcends culture. What is it about your approach that enables enterprise facilitation and the Trinity of Management to be embraced and effective in such disparate environments as Democratic Republic of Congo, Western Australia, state of Kansas. Nepal, Nepal, we have Nepal. some wonderful yeah. ones. Yes, of course. Uh, what it is, is that uh, it's human nature to be uh, uh, wanting to better themselves. Everybody wants to have more, be able to eat, have a roof on the head. And as soon as they have security, they then develop uh, psychological higher needs. And this is the Maslow, uh, Maslow, uh, you know, uh, pyramid of needs. Uh, as soon as we have uh, security, we want then self-esteem, love, companionship, creativity. Uh, and uh, uh, what th the beauty about the approach is that then you arrive like I did in the Gobi Desert in Mongolia. And with an interpreter, we left the mining camp. I was an, uh, a guest of a mining company. And um, he said to me, where do you want to go? And I said, the first yurt that you see 
um, can you ask the local people if I can interview them? <laughs> and so we stopped in the middle of the Gobi Desert. <laughs> there was this yurt and uh, there was outside somebody, you know, with a big, you know, leather coat and said, I am Dr. Siroli. I'm here to look, uh, speak to local entrepreneurs. Could I find out, speak to you? And uh, they were a young husband and, uh, husband and wife couple both engineers, both very well educated. They came back to take care of the camel herd of the parents and they were entrepreneurs. They were producing felt uh, and um, they told me the story and it was like I was in my village in Italy. <laughs> it's, it's another language, another culture, but people are people and you know, uh, you have to respect the culture. But when you scratch the skin, people bleed the same. My father was a doctor. My grandfather was a doctor. You treat pneumonia the same way all over the world. Very good. I also remind uh, people, attendees, to please enter any questions in the chat. We do have a couple, and uh, let me turn to those um, right now. Um, first, how do you see the role of millennials and Zgen in the future of economic development and social innovation? I love them. I think that they are so much better than us. First of all, they're multicultural. Look, look, look at the universities nowadays. Every single conceivable nation. So they're multicultural, and they work in teams. How can they go? How can they lose? <laughs> One of them has an idea. The friend says, "Okay, I can take it to the market." And then let's go and find somebody that understands money. And, you know, this is, uh, I believe that they are so geared up uh, to adopt the, uh, the Trinity of Management. Uh, the other people who really are now uh, wanting to adopt the Trinity of Management are also the veterans, because veterans have been uh, uh, army veterans. They work in teams all the time. And when they leave the army, they're alone and they cannot do anything because <laughs> <laughs> They've not been trained to work alone. They've always been trained to work together. So imagine how easy it is to tell veterans, listen, who is the best person, the best companion that can help you? Uh, we also love to work with uh, this, uh, because there are lots and lots and lots of women now, young girl, uh, um, young women who, who are in business, and they also love to work in teams. So, you know, it's, uh, it's just a revolution, I, I think. Um, I, and Bill, the other thing is this. We are 8 billion people in the world, and we don't have the uh, sustainable technologies to feed, clothe, transport, communicate, heat, you know, cool, 8 billion people in a sustainable way. So this new generation will have to invent everything and new. I call them the, the new Victorians. You remember the Victorians? They <laughs> invented everything we use now, radio, television, X-ray, uh, quantum physics. Everything is uh, was invented 100 years ago. So now we need another revolution. A revolution is inventing how to do all that we do in a sustainable way. Fascinating. And so... Um... What do you see, you know, post-pandemic world that we live in, what do you see in terms of the main challenges um, for local economic development? Uh, is that we have not adopted a new uh, psychology. The psychology that we still use is uh, behaviorism. So our uh, sociology is behavioristic and the behaviorists believe in the carrot and the stick. And the carrot and the stick, it was good for my generation, but gen, uh, the Gen X and the millennials, they don't want to be motivated by anybody. They are self-motivated. So uh, to tell them, oh, if you come to work for my corporation, we give you money. They said, your corporation is so putrid. We don't want to work with your corporation, not even if you pay us. And so it's the great uh, resignation is uh, you know the quiet resignation where people say, I only come and do my work, but I will never ever engage with your values. So I really believe that we have to adopt uh, a new social technology that is uh, developmental psychology. And we hope that out of developmental psychology, ultimately we will have a uh, sociology that is a humanistic sociology where 
uh, all of us uh, developments about helping people to become the beautiful person that they are. Once they become a beautiful person, they beautify their communities, they beautify the world. It's the other way around. It's not for a for an elite to motivate people who are stupid. Is for a for all of us to say how can we get millions, hundreds of millions of people to become phenomenal at doing beautifully what they love to do. Because it takes all of us to beautify the world. How would um, how would if you were a dean for a college of business, let's say, um, how might you go about, uh, I guess, adapting the way we teach business normally so that it aligns with the needs of the people and the uh, everybody at the entrance of anybody who wants to start a business should do a little test to find out whether they are product people, marketing people, or finance people because they're three completely different characters. And once they identify who they are, they have to start to love themselves a little bit more and respect respect the gift that have been given to them at birth. Um, you know, um, neuropsychiatrists, uh, neuropsychologists now say that uh, we, uh, when we are born, we are not uh, an empty vessel. When we are born, we're born with 400 traits from DNA, DNA, a DNA from five generations before us. So at birth, we are already very, very rich. And all these gifts constitute our true being. So what we have to do, we have to make sure that we ask the people, if you could do beautifully what you love to do for the rest of your life, what would you be doing? Uh, it's not a question of making money, or it's not the question of, uh, Abraham Maslow wrote that a, a first class uh, um, mother is better than a second class physician is not what to do is how you do it so now imagine students of business you really want to become involved in entrepreneurship first know yourself who what do you love to do develop the product uh, deliver the service are you the person taking product and service from the laboratories to the main street are you an innovator so uh, it's very, very important for people to know themselves and to be respected. And then what you do when you interview them, then you say to them, oh, my God, that's your beauty. Oh, OK. Now, how can we help you to become the best human being that you can possibly become with the gifts that you have? And you put them on a pedestal, but then you say to them, Hey, this is your competitive advantage. You are six foot nine. You should play basketball. <laughs> Don't do grappling because they're gonna to beat you to pulp. You know, you're too tall. You cannot even see these people. <laughs> so use your competitive advantage in life. But be careful because if you set up an enterprise, the enterprise has to do three things, not you the enterprise. And the response that I get from young people, they say, oh my God, I you say that I should only do what I love? And I say, yeah, you should become the best in the world at doing beautifully what you love. That's success. And you can do it as a writer, as a poet, as a mother, do what you love to do beautifully. But if you want to go into a business, remember your business has to do three things beautifully, not one. So you keep doing what you love, surround yourself with people who do beautifully what you hate doing. So that's that's the trinity of your management. And everywhere we we leave people uh completely stunned. You know, we have people who are um truly uh sometimes really moved by the fact that somebody's seen their beauty. Yeah. Very, very powerful uh, and affirming, I think, as well. Um, the um, We have a question from one of the questions from the audience. It's from Kyle Baus. Um, he's asking really kind of a, a bit of a different shift, but just knowing how global you are and uh, how much you work um, with businesses and entrepreneurs in so many different 
business sectors. He's uh, wondering what business sector you feel might be booming in 10 years' time. Anything which has to do with um, uh, personal services. Okay. The care of the person. Uh, there will be, uh, I really think that anything that uh, machines cannot do, the human touch. The human touch is so so powerful. You can, in, in, in half an hour, you can change the life of a person. And I've done it. I remember this Canadian entrepreneur started to cry, 46 years old man, started to cry when he understood that training and management. He said to me, Ernesto, I should have met you 30 years ago. I went bankrupt the first time. The second time when I went bankrupt, I lost my family. Everybody left me because I was a failure. And now I'm going to go bankrupt the third time. And you know why I'm going uh, uh, bankrupt? It's because I stopped doing what I love to do in the, in the business, to try to learn to do what I hate and I'm mediocre at it. So now I'm mediocre at all fields because I stopped doing what I loved to concentrate in learning what I hated. And now I'm my business in mediocre in all the three areas. So, you know, you can change the life of people. And I think that everything from uh, uh, educating people and uh, um, counseling uh, uh, um, in business to, oh, business <laughs> that are more <laughs> uh, business advisors and mentors and board members and and if you really start to appreciate uh, the psychology, developmental psychology, um, then you have an incredible advantage because uh, <laughs> people, there is, okay, um, there is no greater gift that you can give to a human being but to listening to her or to him. No greatest gift. No greatest gift. So imagine being able to be involved in helping people become this phenomenal, extraordinary human being. And now it's years, Bill, it is years that I only ever see beauty everywhere I go. Mm. Oh, very powerful. Um, we have another question from uh, Usha, and I apologize if I mispronounce your name. Um, Shrestha and uh, Usha is asking the question how unique is the DBA program for the student I think I'm going to rephrase that a little bit just to ask you know you you obviously went on your own doctoral journey um, it sounds like you started it twice um, first time it just wasn't working out um, but then the second time you obviously were successful in earning your doctorate um, Tell us a little bit about the importance of the doctorate to you. Why did you pursue the journey and, and, and what did it do for you? I was very naive. I did not really understand uh, when I was young what a piece of paper, what, a, what a, a, my master uh, was. And uh, I started to work in Africa when I was uh, very, very young, 21 years old. And my father was desperate. <laughs> my father would say, I will pay you exactly what those people are paying you if you only study. <laughs> Typical Italian father, he was really going crazy. And I thought, I'm working, those people with a degree, they are unemployed. I have a job, very proud. But you know what? When that job was uh, basically work in cooperation done by the government, when those kind of jobs were absolutely, to me, disgusting because we were never succeeding, I completed my master's in uh, Roman University. It was that piece of paper that allowed me to go uh, to Australia to do my PhD. It was that piece of paper. And so I'm saying to anybody, <laughs> I was wrong. I was terribly wrong because that piece of paper saved my life. So get yourself, um, uh, uh, make sure that you climb that ladder as much as you can, because from there you have a much broader view. Education, in, in my father's view, was that. Education is you are climbing so that from that vantage point, you see a larger horizon. So in that sense, 
uh, it's very, very important for all of you guys to continue and to follow because that piece of paper, maybe maybe we, you're not going to do what you study, but that piece of paper will be a, a door opener for you worldwide. Great. Well, thank you. The, um, I want to shift back again a little bit to the Trinity of Management because I know one of the other concepts that I've learned from you um, you shared with me is sort of adopt, it's a derivative or plays off of the Trinity of Management. And it's a very powerful, again, in some ways very simple, but in its simplicity, very, very powerful tool or approach to assessing an organization, an organization's health. And I think of the situation you highlighted earlier with the um, entrepreneur who was about to fail for the third time and how this particular tool or approach might have really helped them had they had access to it previously. And it's really the total quality of the company concept or TQ. Oh, yeah. Let me talk a little oh. bit about that because that is another one of those powerful. Yeah, total quality of the company. Uh, there are people who have been in business for a while and things are not going well. And they have a terrible time to understand where is the weakness in the business. And so what we do, we, we draw a vertical axis and horizontal axis. And then we ask to the entrepreneur right now, zero to 100%. Uh, if you had to give yourself a score for the quality of your product, whatever it is, could be a product, a service, but if you had to score zero to 100%, what score would you give yourself? And so there was this guy, this is a true story in, in California. In, uh, uh, he said, oh, oh, my product is fantastic. I've been in business for 27 years. We, we, we have $36 million sales every year, but we are not making any money. We barely break even at $36 million sales. So I said, okay, let's find out what the problem is. So I said, the product, he says 80% quality. Okay, so everything that you do to get the world to know that you have a product, branding, marketing, publicity, uh, uh, public relation, customer uh, care, zero to 100%. So the product is 80%. The guy says, oh, my marketing is very, very good. 80%. So I say, okay, your product is 80% quality, marketing is 80% quality. And I'm thinking, where is the problem? <laughs> so I asked him, everything to do finance, financial controls and management, give yourself a score. And the guy says, right now at the very most 20%. So I'm saying, who is doing finance? And the guy says, me, I'm the owner. I am the CEO. I do not understand anything about finances, but I never trusted anybody to do it. So right now I'm just about you know, collapsing at $36 million of income, we are barely breaking in, and it's my fault. And I said, okay, what do you have to do? Look, 80, 80, 20, what do you have to do? And he says, I'm going to get myself <laughs> a 100% quality CFO, chief financial officer. And by the way, I know the person is the uh, retired CFO of my biggest uh, client, a billion dollar company in California, and we play golf together. And next Saturday, I'm going to say to him, I give you shares in the company, come and, and help us. So the total quality of the company, you ask people who have been in business for two, three, four, five, ten 10 years, right now, tell me what is your product quality, your marketing quality, your finance quality. And we get all management to do it. We have companies where we get 60 middle managers do it in confidence, their own graphs. And then we get all the graphs together and we come with a graph of, for the entire organization. And guess what? They always know what's wrong. They always know what's wrong. And you can do it to your organization now. <laughs> and you will that's find right. that the that's product right. maybe. Yeah, and that's exactly what I was going to add on to it was that even though you tend to focus a lot on uh, supporting entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial um, teams and other other folks uh, within the economic development realm, these concepts are also applicable to any business. Um, yeah. And I, you know, one of the other concepts that I know that you've been working on more recently um, is related to innovation. 
um, and you you call it uh, boundary riders. I, yes. I think in part to honor both. We're writing a new book, actually, my yeah. third book. Yeah. Maybe uh, tell us a little bit a little bit about boundary riders. What happened is that lots and lots of uh, corporations have within the corporation disaffected people, people who go there for the money, but have absolutely no buy in with the life of the corporations. They are called the intrapreneurs. These are the people who are the entrepreneurs inside corporations. And what happens is that they're frustrated because they see opportunities, they see social technologies, they see high tech, and they say, oh my God, if we could only use that technology inside our corporation, we will absolutely transform the world. And they get so frustrated because as soon as they come inside the corporation with a new idea, the direct superior will say, you have not finished to doing what you have to do and you come with a new idea, first do your job. So what happens is that the entrepreneurs, they try once, twice, and then they basically, they go in the mode of the silent resignation, which is, okay, I come, I do the minimum possible, but as soon as I get another job, I will go. Because this is, you know, I my life is not fulfilled. So what we say is that how do you capture the passion, the energy, imagination of your entrepreneurs? So what we've done, everything we learn by facilitating enterprises and community, we have taken that inside corporations. And we say, what if you would allow all the people who still have the spirit, the passion, the entrepreneurial spirit to bring to you things that they have discovered outside of the corporation, technologies, ideas. But there is this, uh, this um, concept is to be very well managed. The CEO has to be uh, the person wanting it. And then next to the CEO, you create an office <clears throat> that is enterprise facilitation for all the people within the corporation who have discovered something of great interest to themselves, that they are prepared to work very hard to make it happen for the corporation if the project can be proved, if the idea can be proved. Very cool. Well, it looks like we've gotten, uh, you're, you've inspired a lot of questions. So let me see if I can pick off a few of them here. Um, got a question from Rohit Sharma. Um, they just started a new new business called Zenkify. It's an online global platform for energy healers who want to start and grow their practice. It's a niche market, but it's going yeah. grow globally. Uh, absolutely. Um, what's your advice? What what should uh, Rohit keep in mind and focus on when looking to expand it globally? Uh, what well, what they have to uh, keep in mind is that they have to make sure that they're that they have an, a fabulous strategic international business developer. They have to have someone who wakes up every day, say, who am I going to speak to today? The field of personal uh, health uh, is enormous. Uh, everybody wants to know how can I have less anxiety? How can I uh, lose weight? I can, how I can be better? So he's exactly one of those fields where I said, personal <laughs> personal services uh, so um, uh, is in the right spot he has to have a team they have to have a team of people who absolutely are uh, character wise they adore what they do and then they find a way of distributing their product internationally that has to uh, has to be fun has to make sense remember that um, uh, when you when you want to scale, the customer acquisition uh, issue is very very important, and uh, there is a cost to it. So you have to think about okay, what can I donate? What can I? Oh, you always lead with a gift. What can I donate? And maybe your gift is the first uh, half an hour. The first hour is free. Maybe you um, uh, you allow people to uh, try some of uh, the techniques and the personnel and the counselor that you have and the healers that you have on your on your uh, um, of the product end of your equation but uh, 
uh, form your team as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. And remember, people who do marketing are different from the people who do product. And those yeah. people need to truly be in love with taking the message to the market, listen to the feedback from the market, and then they have to be given the authority to come back to you, product people, to say they wanted green, they wanted pink, they wanted in a color that you have never thought about. Because it's only when you take it to the market and you listen to the marketing response that you can pivot, that you can really modify your offering. So important to have the right team to start with. Excellent. Excellent. And speaking of feedback, um, one of the questions uh, also added in is when you are developing an entrepreneurial endeavor um, that would have an impact on the local economy, is it important to incorporate feedback from the local governments as well, besides just the market? Be very, very careful not to be discouraged by um, people who have uh, the business as usual mentality. So um, uh, I just, I have a, a book behind me on the shelf that says, don't compete, tilt the field. And, uh, you know, I could not compete with economic development directors in cities. So, because they have all the money, all the strategies to develop the city with infrastructures, lots of money. So what I, I did not compete with them directly. I went to the public, listened to what they wanted because that was tilting the field. <laughs> I basically did something that the economic development director were never doing. They were not walking the streets asking people, what would you like to do? See what I mean? So mm -hmm. there's no, don't ask for permission, uh, ask for forgiveness. And what I did with economic development directors is that I started to, in a sense, compete in a brutal way because I found treasures under the noses that they had they lived there and they did not know that they did not know the people i met <laughs> so i competed brutally but then i took all the successes to them to say now your city is creating more people more uh, more enterprises than any other rural community in the area and you can be very proud of it so then they incorporate an enterprise facilitation in the economic plan. So that's my experience. I think that having government on your side, oh my God, if you can do that. But if you cannot, don't feel discouraged. Thank you. And then Al Baridi, one of our faculty here um, asks, you know, we in the US are, are commenting with the question added to it is, we in the US have the luxury of doing what you like to do and then finding someone to pay you for it. Um, how common is this practice in the rest of the world? Uh, there are no entrepreneurs like the African entrepreneurs. Sub-Sahara Africa, they are going to be the next. You remember they said that the, uh, that the Asian dragon woke up? Now the, the, uh, the African lion has to roar. Nobody. I've never seen entrepreneurs like in Africa. You tell them once about the trade your management. And they said, okay, <laughs> they do it. They do it. They don't have any other, oh, let me call this and let me find out from that. Let me read this. No, you tell them you have to have three people doing beautifully what they love to do, product marketing, finance. And they said, okay, I call my friend who's very good at selling things. And just to give you an example, uh, 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 husband and wife in Katanga in the Congo. They had this tiny little bakery for 10 years, uh, barely making a living with this little bakery. They called the enterprise facilitator, who is uh, our enterprise facilitators are local, so they live in the village. They called him to say, um, uh, What are we doing wrong? You know, we can barely you know, survive. And uh, he said, Okay, uh, pro. Uh, Product marketing finance, husband and wife, what, what do you do? The husband, the product, the wife, the finance. And he said, who's doing your marketing? I said, we open the bakery in the morning. That's what we do. That's how we sell the bread. He says, uh, do you have a friend who can go and find out from the schools and the hospitals if they want bread? 
And the guy says, we never thought about it. Yes, okay. I have a friend who can sell anything to anybody. And the friend went to speak to the army base, spoke to the general, and uh, agree on, ask the general, where do you get your bread for your uh, soldiers every day? He says, from Lubumbashi, seven, seven hours drive every day, trucks full of bread, seven hours trucks. And you did a rainy season, 11 hours. And he says, would you buy bread uh, from us? And the guy said, what's your price? So the first order for that little bakery was 6,500 bread rolls a day. Now they have the biggest rotary oven in Catania. <laughs> and it's like, so, and people said to me, Ernesto, product marketing should be taught in school. And I said, yes, <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> Well, very good. We um, have a couple more minutes. And uh, I think uh, what I'd ask you to do just to sort of pull this all together and summarize is what are two or three main takeaways or points that you'd like our students and viewers to remember that they can use in their everyday lives? Yeah. Uh, don't let go of that school friend who was the most different from you. Because we tend to congregate with people who are like us. But people who, if in business, you have to learn to congregate with people who are very different from you. The finance people are so different from product people uh, and marketing people. And these three, uh, I said to people that business, the only comparison is a marriage. You have two different DNA, the, the male and female D DNA. They will never, ever, ever understand each other. But unless they merge, no new life will be born. A business is three DNA, the DNA of the person who conceived the product or delivered the service, the DNA of the one who, who loves the market, loves to listen to people and give people what they need, and the DNA of the finance people. These three DNA will never understand each other. There's no way. They will never. Product people want more money to develop better products, Marketing people want to give it for free. <laughs> Finance people are screaming at the two of them. Unless these three people, they love each other, they respect each other, unless they have professional, true, true respect for each other, unless these three people come together, no new enterprise will be born. Very good. Well, thank you, Ernesto, for this engaging discussion. If you want more information about Dr. Soroli's books or to watch his TED Talks, you can visit soroli.com. Now, let me turn this back over to Dr. Sandro. Thank you, Bill. I want to thank you for um, inviting um, Ernesto to our webinar and uh, having a fantastic, very informative discussion with him. Uh, Ernesto, thank you so much for uh, being here. I'm sure our webinar audience appreciates it greatly. Before we finish, I just want to mention that uh, we have a couple of things going on here at Westcliff. Celebrate a wide array of world cultures with traditional foods, clothing, music, and more at Westcliff's International Food and Culture Fair on December 6th. Finally, look out for articles that have been accepted by the Westcliff International Journal of Applied Research. It will be published on November 27th. Once again, I want to thank both Dr. William Lightfoot and Dr. Ernesto Ciroli for providing so much insight into the entrepreneurial mindset. And I want to thank you, our webinar audience, for attending. Please take the time to complete our evaluation form, which will be sent to you via email. Thank you and good afternoon.